Hi, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to this afternoon's NUS Law Graduate Programs Information Session. Can we perhaps have the slides there? Thank you. In the interest of sustainability, we will not be distributing physical copies of the brochures, so I will keep the QR code on the screen for a couple of seconds so that you can scan the QR code and access the LLM brochure as well as the Juris Doctor brochure. If you would like to access the brochures and you're not able to scan the QR code, you are also able to access copies of the brochures on our NUS Law website. So let me very quickly take you through an overview of today's program. But before that, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Sybil. I'm the head of NUS Law Admissions and Outreach. And I have with me today our admissions team. Um, if you could just stand and wave your hands. So if you have any questions at the end of this session and we're not able to take it during the session, you can address your questions to the team. I have Ms. Josephine Chow. Um, she takes care of our LM programs as well as Ms. Melissa Ng, who takes care of our Juris Doctor programs. So we will start off today with an overview of NUS Law's LM programs, and thereafter it will be a NUS Law Juris Doctor Program Overview, and this will be followed by a Q&A session. So first today, we are very privileged to have with us our Vice Dean Graduate Studies, Professor Umakant Verotil. He will be sharing with us an overview of NUS Law's LLM programs. Prof Umakant, please. Thank you, Sibyl, and uh, welcome to all of you, Thank you. Uh, both uh, in person and uh, online. Uh, as Sibyl mentioned, I oversee the uh, graduate programs, which include both the uh, LLM and JD programs. So I'll speak a little bit about the LLM program, give you an overview about NUS Law uh, as the law school, uh, before handing over to my colleague, uh, Justin, uh, who will be speaking about the uh, JD programs. So. Uh, an overview of uh, NUS law, uh, and this is the moniker that we like to use, which is NUS law is uh, Asia's global law school. So as I will mention, uh, we are Singapore's uh, first law school and oldest law school. We also play an important part in uh, Asia because we have a lot of focus on Asian law because as some of you might know, uh, Singapore uh, being at the heart of Asia uh, plays an important role in providing a legal system uh, for arbitrating and deciding disputes uh, in the region as well. So uh, consistent with that approach, uh, we play an important role in uh, uh, Asian context. And we're also in a global uh, setting. Uh, we focus a lot on international law and international cross-border matters as well. So that's uh, the focus behind uh, Asia's global law school. So uh, what is our background? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are uh, Singapore's oldest law school. We were established in 1957. Uh, and uh, it's only about a uh, few years ago that we celebrated our 60th anniversary and soon we'll be celebrating our 70th anniversary. Uh, so the, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very important uh, institution uh, in the development of uh, Singapore law. And uh, you know, just in, in terms of some boasts, uh, Singapore uh, NUS law has also uh, ranked very highly. Uh, we've been consistently ranked uh, number one uh, in the Asian context, and we also rank quite highly in the global rankings as well. So as uh, some of the uh, rankings indicate, the Times uh, World Rankings uh, puts us at uh, number 11, and uh, the QS rankings places at, uh, us at number 12. And in some years, we've also uh, gone into the number 10 uh, with the top 10 rankings as well. So it's a very highly ranked institution. So what can one expect uh, in NUS law as a whole? Uh, of course, uh, the NUS Law prides of a very international and diverse uh, faculty. So we have, we have about 80 full-time faculty members, apart from visitors, uh, and adjunct uh, faculty members from many other universities uh, and uh, you know, pr professions uh, across the world. And uh, we also focus a lot on the future-ready uh, pedagogy. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, we, f we are in an international and global setting. So uh, we really prepare ourselves, ourselves and our students uh, for, for an increasingly globalized uh, world. And we also have an uh, excellent uh, set of facilities uh, and provide a learning uh, environment, both hardware and software. 
So in terms of the hardware, we do have a very uh, state-of-the-art moot court, which uh, NUS law is also, uh, you know, performed very well across the globe for, for a long time. Uh, in addition to uh, seminar rooms, lecture theaters, and a very well-stocked library. Uh, in fact, if any of you uh, haven't done so, I would highly recommend visiting the NUS law library. Uh, the, you know, you would get a day pass uh, to visit and have a look at the collection. So uh, that's, again, something that we take a lot of pride uh, in. So with that background, let me talk a little bit about the master's program or the LLM program uh, at NUS uh, Law. So the LLM program is a one-year uh, program. Uh, it's a master's program for those who already have an undergraduate degree uh, in law. And uh, as the, uh, uh, the slide suggests, uh, we have a, a coursework program. So we don't have a LLM by research. All our LLM programs are by coursework. And we have a number of different specializations uh, that I'll really talk about. So the first program uh, is an LLM in general, uh, an LLM no specialization, which means students can choose from any number of different courses uh, without having to specialize in any particular uh, area. Uh, and that is of interest for those who want to spread their knowledge uh, around and gain uh, a lot from different fields uh, across the base. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of the specializations in a moment. Uh, because most of our students actually go in for specializations uh, because this is an era where people want to specialize in uh, different areas of the law and at a master's level I can understand the attraction uh, in uh, you know going in for specializations and we also have a, a couple of double degree programs uh, the first one being a double degree program with uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy who I'm told are holding the same session in another room right now so there's a double degree program for law and public policy. Uh, and that is a two year program where students can get uh, a, a degree in both public policy as well as uh, in law. Uh, and for those of you who might be interested in that program, uh, there is a need to get admitted individually into each of the schools in order to get, uh, it's, it's not an automatic admission into one program and which, which leads to the other. Uh, students need to qualify for both uh, those programs. And the second program which we have is in arbitration and dispute resolution with the well-known University of Geneva MIDS uh, program uh, that specializes in arbitration where students can spend one year at NUS and the second year in Geneva or, or uh, uh, a second half year in Geneva or vice versa. So uh, th that's another popular program which some of our smart students uh, do take. So what do students have to do in the LLM program? They usually have to take uh, about 40 to 44 units of study, which uh, translates into about 10 to 12 uh, courses or units. So uh, students may have to take about five or six courses in each semester uh, in order to get the uh, LLM uh, de degree. And uh, uh, usually uh, as our courses are uh, based on a bidding system. So most of the courses for the LLM program are electives. So students can choose from almost 120 electives uh, in each academic year. And uh, some courses are very popular, so we have a bidding system. So uh, students have to bid some points, and depending on how high they bid, they are entitled to get uh, into those courses. But uh, many courses uh, don't get subscribed uh, to the full because we have a, a class cap of 50 uh, students. So no class can be more than 50 students. We don't want... Uh, you know, we want to provide a, a fairly personal teaching experience and learning experience for our students. So that's the reason why we have this cap of 50 students. So some courses are popular, uh, where it's, it tends to be a bit difficult, but most other courses should be able to accommodate the interests of, of all students. So this brings me to something which is very crucial in our LLM program, which is the different specializations. And uh, these specializations, as you can imagine, are consistent with Singapore's own strengths uh, in specific areas of the law. So uh, one of the important areas that I've already talked about is LLM in Asian legal studies. So quite a few uh, students are interested in knowing something about Asian legal systems as a whole, whether it be Singapore, Malaysia, uh, China, Vietnam, India, Japan, Korea. Uh, I, we can't promise to teach every single jurisdiction in each year, but we try to have a different mix of courses on each of these uh, different jurisdictions so students can get a good sense of what's happening in the overall Asian scene. The second uh, specialization is something that's become very crucial and very critical, which is uh, intellectual property and technology law. 
Uh, this is the age of the AI, chat GPT, uh, so on and so forth. So what are the legal implications of some of these uh, cutting edge technological issues? So those are the uh, aspects that we deal with uh, in uh, the intellectual property and technology uh, course. The third one is international and comparative law, uh, which is also, again, a very important focus area. Uh, Singapore uh, is uh, you know, a tiny country, so maintaining strong international relations is a very important focus uh, for Singapore. So uh, the focus on international law uh, becomes quite important. Similarly, with maritime law, uh, Singapore is one of the largest and busiest ports uh, in the world. So uh, understanding the importance of maritime law, maritime issues uh, is quite critical. And we do have a, uh, 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 some uh, experts who work in this field, uh, including on cutting edge issues such as unmanned ships uh, and uh, you know, so on. So what are the legal issues surrounding that? So th this is an, another very important area of the law. The other area which is quite uh, significant in the Singapore context is international arbitration and dispute resolution. So this is a LLM program specialization that we introduced only about five, six years ago, but it has become uh, our biggest billing uh, so far because we have a huge interest in this specialization. And what is the reason for this? There are a number of reasons for this because Singapore has become a hub for uh, dispute resolution in the region, not just for domestic and local laws, but also for the region as a whole. So th there is a Singapore International Arbitration Center, Singapore International Commercial Court, Sin Singapore International Mediation Center. So there's an entire ecosystem for dispute resolution that Singapore is known for, and our specialization focuses a lot uh, on, on all of these issues. And we have the best arbitrators from around the world best arbitration professionals, academics, who do come and teach uh, in this program uh, as well. And uh, we even have the Singapore International Arbitration Center, SIAC, offering a course uh, explaining their rules uh, and so on. So that's uh, something that uh, has re recently received a lot of attention. And then we have the corporate and financial services law. Uh, I, I don't need to explain this because uh, corporate and financial services are very, very crucial to Singapore's uh, financial ecosystem. Uh, the, Singapore is a leader uh, in cutting edge regulation uh, in this particular area uh, and uh, our corporate and financial services uh, law focuses uh, on this. And the last one is an interesting one which I've left uh, for the end which is the international business law program. And the international law business program is a very interesting program because it allows students to spend the first semester in Singapore at NUS and take the courses here and spend the second semester in Shanghai at our partner university, which is East China University of Political Sciences and Law. So this allows students to get two country, two city experiences in uh, one year. And even in the second semester in Shanghai, uh, many uh, colleagues, including myself, we actually go there uh, and offer some courses as well. So students get to experience mostly NUS law professors, but sometimes also our partner university uh, professors from EECUPL. So for students who are interested in uh, multi-jurisdictional experiences and multi-city living, uh, that's one interesting aspect uh, as well, especially for students from overseas or even outside Asia who want to get an extended experience of Asia, that would be uh, an aspect to think about. So how does all this fit within the intellectual environment within NUS law? Uh, NUS law also has a number of different research centers. I, for, for, the, for want of time, I'm, I'm not going to go through each of them, but a lot of our specializations also tie in very well with the research centers that we have. And so uh, stu our students can, in the specializations, can very much connect uh, with uh, all the activities that are going on in the uh, research centers mostly being a lot of talks and seminars and lectures which are given through the centers which students can also participate in and also have other research opportunities uh, to the extent possible uh, during their busy semester at NUS Law. So a few things about the application program. Uh, the application currently for the next year, next academic year is open. So as you can see, we start, opened up our applications on 1st of September. And for those of uh, you who are interested in applying for in intake in uh, 2025, 
uh, you have to apply by 15th of October, and all the details are provided uh, on the website. And what do we look for? We, we look for the LLM program. Uh, the admission standards are a good bachelor's degree in law. Uh, for those uh, from non-English speaking jurisdictions, uh, minimum English tests. Uh, although those who are from you know, English speaking jurisdictions or who have done their bachelor degree in English, you can seek an exemption from the English text, test as well. And there are procedures which my colleagues can answer or you can write in to our colleagues and, and we would uh, answer that as well. And uh, the fees are uh, also provided for here. Uh, four of our specializations are what are called as subsidized programs. So for those of you who are Singapore citizens or permanent residents, there's a fairly hefty subsidy for uh, these four programs. Uh, but for the other programs, there, there is no subsidy. These are like fully funded programs and they cost uh, about 41,300 this year. This could go up a little bit uh, next year, but it'll be broadly uh, in this kind of range. So we do recognize that these are uh, quite expensive programs, uh, but in order to make sure that no uh, deserving student is left, uh, you know, without uh, being admitted into the program for financial reasons. We also do have some scholarships available. Of course, we would love to give scholarships to every deserving student, but unfortunately our resources are limited as well. But to the extent possible, uh, students do get either full or part, part uh, scholarships. Uh, and uh, one of the requirements is if students do need scholarships, they must uh, apply by indicating another, uh, by providing another statement uh, at the time of application, justifying why they do need the scholarship. So these are some of the highlights of our uh, LLM program. I'll now hand over to my colleague, uh, Professor Justin Tan, to speak about the JD program. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Umar Khan. So I'm Justin, and it's a pleasure to see all of you today. Um, I'm here to talk about the second graduate law program that NUS Law has. It's called the Juris Doctor Program, or the JD Program. So the JD Program is different from the LOM Program um, in two ways. The first is, the LOM program does not give you a pathway to get qualified to practice law in Singapore. So most, not all, but most of our LOM graduates, after graduation, they go back to their home country. Um, they don't stay in Singapore to work as lawyers. The JD program, on the other hand, provides a pathway for you to graduate from the program, sit for the Singapore bar course, pass the Singapore bar exam, and get caught to the Singapore bar, meaning you will become a Singapore qualified lawyer. You can work practicing Singapore law in a law firm in Singapore. So that's the first difference. The second difference is the JD program is a longer program. So Professor Umakan shared that the LOM program takes one year. The JD program, on the other hand, takes either two years or three years. So the course, the JD program was launched in quite recently, in 2020. And I'm going to skip to the bottom here. It's going to be a two-year course if you hold a basic law degree from another jurisdiction. Usually, it will be a basic law degree from a civil law jurisdiction. So Singapore, we are a common law jurisdiction because we were once a British colony. If you come or your law degree was from a civil law jurisdiction, you can go for the two-year JD. And the three-year JD is available if your first degree is a non-law degree. So your first degree could be anything. It could be science, it could be engineering, it could be maths, it could be philosophy, it could be political science, it could be business. Anything else, as long as you have a first undergraduate degree that is not a law degree, 
you can try for the three-year JD. Now, let me go to the third bullet point on this slide. Professor Umar Khan shared that the way that you get selected or admitted into the LLM program is by having a good um, first law degree, a good first law degree. And then there's the English proficiency test, which you might get exempted for, etc. For the JD program, it is slightly more rigorous. After you apply, you might get shortlisted for a second round of selection. And the second round of selection has two components. First, an interview, and second, a written test. The interview and written test are done fully online via Zoom, so you don't have to fly down to Singapore to do it. JD candidates also have the same internship and traineeship opportunities as LLB students. So because the JD is also a pathway to practice Singapore law, so it's similar to the LLB program because most LLB students after graduation will sit for the Singapore bar exam, pass it and get admitted to practice law in Singapore. So the JD program and the LLB program are similar in terms of the end goal and the end goal being practicing law in Singapore. And because the goal is, the, usually the end goal is the same, so usually the internship and uh, traineeship opportunities um, for JD students will be quite similar as those for LLB students. Now this is not to say that there are no traineeship or there are no internship opportunities uh, for LLM students. There are. Um, it's just that because the LLM program is shorter, just one year, it is really intense uh, academics-wise. So there are naturally less opportunities for internships because it's a, just a sh much shorter program. But of course, if you think you can handle both the LLM program and doing internship part-time work, uh, you are allowed to do some amount of part-time work as an LOM student under your student pass. But generally, we don't recommend this because it's going to be a very academically intense period to do your LLM, LLM concurrent with working as an intern. It's possible, but it's going to be very challenging. So we don't generally recommend it. Okay, so the structure of the JD program is pretty similar to the structure of the LLB undergraduate in law program. The curriculum consists of compulsory courses and elective courses. For the compulsory courses, these courses are not open to LLM students. These compulsory courses are compulsory precisely because the JD program, I'm going to sound like a broken record, provides a pathway to sing practice Singapore law. And therefore, the compulsory courses are compulsory because they are courses on basic Singapore law. So basic Singapore tort law, basic Singapore contract law, and another example, basic Singapore company law, which uh, Professor Umar Khan is, is an expert on. Okay, so because the JD is meant to provide a pathway to practice Singapore law, so you need the basics of Singapore law. And that's what the compulsory courses are there for. They are compulsory precisely for that reason. And then after you finish the compulsory course uh, bucket, you can do, you can take electives. Means this is similar to uh, what Professor Umakan shared about bidding for elective courses, which the LOM student will be very familiar with. So if, as a JD student, you spend your first few semesters doing compulsory courses, and after you clear all your compulsory courses, you can start bidding for the elective courses, and the same number of elective courses, or 120 of them that Professor Umar Khan uh, mentioned, they are all available to you to bid for. The application into our JD program. The application period is the same as 
the application period for the LOM program. For admission into the JD program next August, you have to apply between 1st September and 15th October this year. So we are currently within the application window. To apply for the two-year JD program, you will need uh, you, this is usually oh, this program, as mentioned, is usually for law graduates from a civil law country, or and this is rarer, but it's possible. Or you could be a graduate from a common law university, uh, but it's non-gazetted. So there are certain uh, universities which are also a common law. They also teach common law, but they are not gazetted. So if you want to practice in Singapore. Uh, practice law in Singapore, you need to do this two-year JD program. We particularly welcome applicants for the two-year JD program from the ASEAN, the Southeast Asian region, China, as well as Europe. And these jurisdictions, as you can uh, tell, they are all civil law jurisdictions. And indeed, most of our two-year JD students come from these countries, civil law countries. And for the three-year JD program, you should have a university degree in any non-law discipline with at least a cum laude or second class upper honours degree or equivalent. And just like with the LOM, there is an English proficiency score requirement, uh, IELTS, a TOEFL of at least 100, and IELTS academic of at least 7.5. There is, as I mentioned, a stage two. After applying and assuming you, be, uh, you are shortlisted, you will be invited to do a written test and an interview. And these are the dates. The written test is on the 20th of February. The, interview, uh, the interviews are conducted across two days, 21st and 22nd February next year. Again, these are conducted fully online. Fees. The JD program fees are as follows. For the two-year JD program, these are the full program fees, which includes um, uh, prevailing 9% goods and services tax in Singapore. The current fees are 67250 for the two-year JD and $89,700 um, for the three-year JD. These are all in Singapore dollars. Uh, one Singapore dollar, um, or rather, um, one US dollar is about 1.3 uh, Singapore dollars. Now, these tuition fees here are subject to change. Usually, they will be increased by about 3-4%. So, this is the fees for um, the students that are Currently, and which current who currently entered the program last month in August of 2024. If you apply during this period and you are admitted, you will start in August 2025, and the fees will be slightly higher, about three or four percent higher than these fees here. Um, there is also a non-refundable deposit that you have to pay if you accept our offer, um, and this uh, non-refundable deposit is about three thousand three hundred Singapore dollars that fee will be applied towards your tuition fee uh, if you uh, honour your acceptance and you come on board the JD program. There are, like the LLM program, there are also scholarships available for the JD program. Um, these are very kindly sponsored by the Tahir uh, Foundation. The Tahir Foundation sponsors our JD scholarships. Like the LLM, you have to submit a statement for scholarship at the point of application. Uh, I mentioned internship opportunities, which are more pertinent to JD students because they want to try out working in Singapore and they have two or three years to do so. So we have a very um, vibrant and on the ball careers office, which will help students do things like mock interview, draft cover letter, draft CV to help them apply uh, for internships, which usually happens between May to the end of July each year. And the internships will be with law firms in Singapore uh, as well as corporations. 
as well as government bodies and legal service and public interest organizations. So these are all kind of um, organizations that you can do internships with. In particular, for public interest organizations, if you are um, if you are interested in international arbitration and dispute resolution, we do have interests. Uh, we do have um, placements with the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, and the Permanent Court of Arbitration, um, Singapore Office, and we have sort of quote unquote institutional um, internships with them, where they rely on us to nominate students and. This is highly competitive, as you can imagine, but the deserving students uh, will end up going to um, the ICJ or the PCA to do an internship. Location. So, Professor Uma Khan shared that we were... Um, well, maybe, maybe I, I, I... Let me rewind that. We are currently located at what is called the Bukit Timah campus which is near to the Singapore Botanical Gardens, which is a UNESCO uh, site, heritage site. But when you apply, and if you are offered and you accept our offer, you would start your law school in what is the Yale NUS campus. So the Yale NUS campus is maybe a 20-minute drive from the current law campus, and it is part of the main uh, campus of NUS. So the reason why we are moving back to the main campus is because um, to improve interdisciplinary learning and to improve student life and student interaction. So we will be joining back the mothership, the main NUS campus, and we are taking uh, what used to be the Yale NUS campus. And this is a picture of uh, that area, which is called University Town, um, at night. That's the picture on the right. Accommodation. Uh, graduate students, you can apply for on-campus accommodation. This is subject to availability. Um, and these are pictures of the kind of accommodation that NUS offers. On the left is Prince George's Park. Um, and on the right, this is U-Town, which I mentioned is going to be where uh, law school will move to starting August next year. So on the right, this is just a part uh, of U-Town. Now I would uh, hand the time over to Sybil, uh, Sybil who will talk a bit about uh, Singapore as uh, just a place to live and to work. Sybil, please. Thank you, Prof. Umakan and Prof. Justin, uh, for taking us through the overview of our LLM as well as our Juris Doctor programs. So if you uh, liked what you heard, uh, to those of you who are physically here in Singapore, I apologize, I'll be taking five minutes to just share a little bit more about Singapore, because we do have audience members who are watching this via live streaming. So Singapore is a great place to study, work and live, and I chose this photo to encapsulate some of the reasons why Singapore is a great place for you to study, work, and live. If you see the background of this picture, you will see our central business district, and that represents uh, some of the great job opportunities we have here, with over 7,000 MNCs operating here, as well as nearly half of Asian regional HQs based here. We also have one of the lowest income tax in the world. Well, Singapore is a melting pot of different cultures, and exciting arts events, as well as a vibrant entertainment scene. We are here in the Marina Bay Sands. Uh, you will also see, for example, Esplanade Theatres on the bay in the picture. Well, I think just uh, last weekend, we had the exciting adrenaline-pumping um, Marina Bay uh, street circuit night race here uh, in Singapore where McLaren's Lando Norris, um, here in this picture as well, uh, he, he won after leading 62 laps around the Marina Bay street circuit. So Singapore is definitely a lively place to work after you've done, you're done with the day, done with your graduate studies, um, you can 
chill, relax, and, and go for one of these exciting events. Feeling hungry, you're never more than 10 minutes away from anything ranging from Michelin star restaurants to affordable hawker delights. So I chose to um, show you a night scene of Singapore because Singapore is one of the safest cities in the world. As you can see, it is the safest city here in Asia. So there's never any worry about your safety if you're heading out to town uh, to have a great night out, um, to enjoy some of the F&B and entertainment um, offerings which I shared earlier. Well, if you're sick of Singapore, uh, we are also less than two hours flight to places like Phuket, Penang, Langkawi, and less than three hours flight from places like Bali, um, Bangkok as well. And within Singapore, there's little need to own a car. Um, I apologize for all the train errors um, and problems, but usually we have a very efficient uh, train system, bus system, and grab public transport where you can head around without the need to own a car. So if you, um, and, you know, found any of the programs interesting, um, I would say that uh, NUS Law is really a wonderful place to do your graduate program. Um, we are at the cutting edge of research, and the vibrant intellectual environment uh, is a great place for you um, to, to, to maybe upgrade your qualifications as well as to build connections um, with some of the fine legal minds we have here. So as uh, Prof. Justin mentioned, our applications are open. So if you would like to find out more about our LLM or JD program, you can scan the QR code or visit our website. You will also see a QR code uh, linking to our application portal on the screen right now. Um, this can also be accessed via NUS Law social media account as well as LinkedIn account. So this is uh, our email address. I would like to apologize if we're not able to take all your questions today. Um, we will have a Q&A session in a couple of minutes. Maybe I could invite Prof. Justin and Prof. Puma Khan to take the stage. Um, thank you for your questions to our live streaming audience as well because I've received some of them and I'll be directing your questions um, to our speakers, but if we are unable to take your questions, please feel free to write in. I would also like to encourage anyone here, if you have any questions, to just go to the microphone, uh, introduce yourself and ask uh, any questions you have directed to both of our speakers here. But maybe first of all, if we could just uh, maybe this question is for Prof. Uh, Umakant. How diverse is our NUS LLM program and do you typically take in um, local or international students? Uh, thanks uh, for that question. And uh, it's a very important question because uh, uh, we do have a very diverse uh, LLM program. And uh, just to give you uh, some very quick statistics, uh, this year we have uh, students from oh, about 22 different nationalities. And uh, interestingly, we have about 190 students, so close to 200. That's the kind of number that we're looking at for uh, the next year as well. And uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, we have an overwhelmingly high number of women students uh, to, ma to ma male students. So in that sense, uh, you know, in that uh, aspect, also we're doing very well uh, in terms of diversity. And, uh, both uh, Prof Professor Justin Tan, myself, uh, Ms. Sibyl, we, we are all working very hard to expand the diversity. So we are actually reaching out to students from different countries who've never been here before, even North America, Latin America, Europe. So our uh, uh, goal is to make it even more diverse than uh, it currently already is. And the last point, uh, in our LLM program, we have an overwhelmingly international uh, student body. So most of our students are from other countries other than Singapore. It's only a small number of students who are uh, from uh, Singapore. So it's kind of the flip side of the LLB. LLB is mostly Singapore students and a few international, but uh, our LLM program is mostly international and a few LLB students, uh, sorry, a few domestic students. Thank you for taking that question. Um, I have a quick question here regarding double degree with the School of Public Policy. Do we have to submit two different applications? I can take that question. Yes, you have to submit two different applications. Uh, and for more details, you can refer to um, the various websites for our faculty as well as the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Now we have another question with regards to our JD program. And I will direct this question to Prof. Justin. Um, the question was, um, 
basically what are the characteristics which the, the JD program looks for when selecting students? Um, and do they need to do any um, background readings or background preparation before the JD program? Okay, uh, thanks for the question. Um, to enter a law program, um, I think you need a good command of English and then you need a good verbal reasoning and good written reasoning. So the interview is meant to assess your verbal reasoning skills and your the written test is meant to assess your written reasoning skills. Other than that, um, you don't have to prepare, you don't have to pre-read any um, legal materials. Um, none of when you interview for the program, we are going to assume you have zero legal knowledge and you're not expected to have any pre-acquired um, pre legal knowledge. So the, the kind of questions in the interview would really just be to assess, as well as the written test, would really just be to assess your reasoning ability, whether it's verbal in the case of the interview or written in the case of the written test. Thank you for that. There is another question on the JD program. Um, it is, can you introduce the career pathways that are available for JD graduates? And what's the job support that we have for international students? So basically, what are the career pathways for JD graduates? Um, as well as what's the kind of support uh, you provide to international students? Um, maybe Prof Justin first, then Prof Umakan. Okay. Um, the career pathways for a JD student um, are the, pretty much the same as the career pathways for an LLB graduate student, uh, a student who graduates with an LLB. Um, there were two slides earlier which showed the internship opportunities um, and that pretty much, um, are, those are pretty much the job opportunities that are available to a JD graduate as well. So most um, law graduates with a JD would want to practice Singapore law. So they would try to find a job in a law firm in Singapore, practicing Singapore law as a lawyer. Uh, some would apply to the government. So the government has lawyers as well, um, whether in the criminal um, team, criminal def um, prosecution team, uh, or the government civil lawyers team, or in the government's international affairs uh, team, which helps Singapore deal with uh, treaties, international obligations, etc. Um, and then, so those law firms, government, the third would be um, corporates, so working in a company as an in-house lawyer. So it's like the company's lawyer in-house. Uh, usually those would require some working experience, but it's also possible to be hired as a fresh graduate to be an in-house lawyer. And lastly, there will be international organizations and VWOs, um, public interest groups that may need a legal expertise. So usually, I think vast majority will end up working as lawyers in law firms in Singapore, but there are a few who will work in government or in corporates and really, really few would work uh, in international organizations or NGOs. And um, maybe you want to... Yeah, uh, just to add, uh, as Prof. Justin Tan mentioned, uh, the, uh, the pathway is similar to LLB students. And uh, one of the requirements to practice uh, Singapore law is to qualify for the Singapore bar. So like our LLB students, our JD students would also take the bar examination and uh, also uh, undergo a practice training contract. So that takes about like a year or a year and a half after the JD program. So for those students who want to qualify for Singapore law, they'll have to follow through that process as well. Uh, and uh, that, that, that is something that our LLB students do too. So I think that's just uh, something to keep in mind as well. For those of you who might want to stay on in Singapore, from, if you're from overseas, uh, and then practice uh, Singapore law. Are there any questions here from the audience here? Feel free to go to the microphones if you have any questions. 
So I have one question here. How long does it take um, for us to be informed uh, of the shortlisting outcome uh, to be invited for interviews? Uh, the, the team will endeavour to inform um, uh, shortlist, shortlisted candidates uh, before February. So for any updates, you can also refer to our website for that. Um, there's also some, I think there are two questions with regards to specific um, questions relating to their documents. So I would encourage these two individuals to write in uh, to our law grad admissions email address and we will give you um, the most customized, the best answer based on your specific situation. I see that time may be up soon, so uh, last call for any questions from uh, audience members here, um, as well as uh, maybe one or two more questions here from the platform. Uh, there is one question here. They, they, they wanted to find out a little bit more about current students in both the LLM as well as JD program. Um, do you have uh, any thoughts or any insights into uh, what kind of career pathways do they pursue? Any success stories you would like to share uh, from our JD or our LLM class? So maybe I'll start with the LLM program. Uh, so uh, a lot of our LLM students are from different countries other than Singapore as we uh, spoke about. Uh, a lot of them go back uh, and uh, you know to their own countries uh, with an enhanced learning of the legal world and then they excel in what, what, what they do. Uh, some of them uh, you know have gone into academia, uh, a lot of them are partners of uh, leading law, law firms in their own jurisdictions. And uh, quite a few of our LLM students also end up staying on uh, in Singapore as well, although uh, we, we, I must uh, say that that number tends to be fairly uh, small given that Singapore is a very, uh, you know, sm a small legal community in that sense. But those who have stayed, uh, stayed on in Singapore have also done uh, fairly well. Some of them have become law firm partners. And I think you asked for success stories. I, one of our success stories that I can think of offhand is our relationship with the Singapore International Arbitration Center. So uh, at least one uh, graduate from our LLM program in uh, International Arbitration and Dispute Resolution ends up working as a legal counsel in, uh, in the Singapore International Arbitration Center. And the SIAC is not an end in itself. SIAC is usually a pathway to something else. So they all go on to become arbitrators themselves, uh, to go on to join uh, law firms as arbitrators or arbitration practitioners. So our relationship with the SIAC and some of the other arbitration institutions uh, would be our real uh, success story, one, one of them to speak about. Uh, our JD program is, is a, a, you know, a, a very, very new. So in fact, our first batch graduated this year. So they're still undergoing like training uh, contracts and so on. But, uh, you know, it, 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 depending on the type of specialization students are looking at, that would certainly be uh, an area uh, where they, uh, for JD students, it's, it's a lot more uh, in terms of opportunity because they are eligible to practice law in Singapore. So the ability to be in Singapore and practice is much higher than in the LLM program. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, agree, I agree with uh, everything Professor Uma Khan shared. Uh, I would like to flag that even if your L the LLM program is a one-year program, um, but after you, so it usually ends in May because it's, the program is August to about May when exams are comp uh, end in May. Um, so if you go for the LLM program, you, you enter NUS Law August 2025 and you graduate about May, June 2026. And after you graduate or after you end your studies, um, you can apply for a pass, an uh, immigration pass in Singapore, which allows you to stay for an additional one year to look for a job. So you can, you can continue staying in Singapore to look for a job for about one year. It's, this is subject to the government's uh, approval of your application, but um, from, from most of our students, they, they have no problem getting this permission, this approval. So most of them, they are able to stay for an additional year uh, to look for a job in Singapore. Um, I think if you're doing an LM in Singapore, as I said, this one year, it's very intense. Um, I don't suggest you do an internship. What I, rather, what, what I suggest you do is um, to pick, make full use of the career events. We have an, a career talk almost um, once 
about one and a half talks every two weeks. So it's about two talks every three weeks during term time. So um, put yourself out there, go for career talks, um, make yourself known, network with the people who come, and uh, try to um, consult our career advisors for help with cover letter and interview skills, mock interviews, etc. So LOM students who can increase their chances of finding a job in Singapore if they are very targeted in in networking, in, in, in attending career talks, etc. So um, there are success stories of LOM students who find jobs in Singapore and usually they follow this kind of path that I've just mentioned. Yeah. Thank you for that. As we are coming to the last three minutes of this talk, I think this will be a very good wrap-up question since this is an information session. Um, maybe just if you could please share one or two key factors that will help an applicant to stand out during the admissions process, um, seeing that admission to our graduate programs is highly competitive, um, especially for those with backgrounds outside the legal profession. Okay, um, so different programs will have uh, different, uh, we look for different things. Um, but generally speaking, um, if you have a good first degree, whether it's a law degree in the case of a, a LOM, or if it's a, you're applying for JD, it could be a law degree or it could be a degree in something else. Um, as long as your first degree is, you, you scored well, you have good grades, um, you know, you, you will have a good chance. And if it's a JD program and you're shortlisted, for the interview and written test, um, as mentioned, if you write clearly, if you display reason, good analytical reasoning skills, written and verbal, uh, you have a good chance. So um, just trust the process. Um, there is no requirement to have a long list of internships. Um, that's not something that we pay particular attention to, so there's no, you, you don't have to say, okay, to apply for NUS graduate program, I, I must do four or five internships. Um, that is not really something that we are super, uh, pay a lot of attention to. Uh, although, of course, if you are doing some specialization, like say, uh, maritime law specialization or international arbitration uh, specialization for LLM, then if you say, you know, I, I work in a shipping law firm, or I've in the shipping industry, that that's kind of relevant to why you want to do maritime law, or you work in some kind of arbitration practice before. That's also um, relevant and will be will, will give you some kind of like quote unquote uh, extra uh, plus points for admission. But it's not a requirement. You do not have to have done all these internships with to show that you're so called interested in arbitration or uh, shipping or maritime law. So it's not a requirement, but if you have those kind of things, it's it, it doesn't hurt. Yep. Yeah, just to very quickly add on the last point that Prof. Justin Tan mentioned, I think one question we get a lot is, uh, should students apply to uh, an LLM or a two-year JD program immediately after law school, or should they get practice experience for a little bit? And I don't think there's a right way to do it. It, it really depends. We have a mix of students who have come straight out of their undergraduate degree into the LLM program, and we have students coming in with a lot of experience. Uh, of course, uh, having experience has a little bit of advantage in the sense that, uh, as Prof. Justin Tan said, it might help with the application process, especially for specializations. And it also gives you a different perspective in the LLM program itself, because you're learning uh, something with a different viewpoint after already having practiced a little bit. So the learning experience might be slightly different, but I don't think there's one way of doing it. Uh, both options are equally plausible. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Justin, as well as Prof. Umakan for taking the questions today. And I would like to thank everyone for attending this afternoon's uh, NUS Law Graduate Program's information session. Uh, as uh, we mentioned earlier, admission applications are now open, so we look forward to receiving all your applications. And if you have any questions which are not answered today, please feel free to either approach us here or to write into our email and we will address all your queries. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.
Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of today's session. We appreciate your participation and engagement throughout the day. Now, before you go, can you please uh, scan the QR code? Uh, please uh, help us by giving us some feedback. And you might just stand a chance uh, to have uh, some Amazon vouchers during our lucky draw. So just uh, do us a favor, let us know how we're doing and how we can improve to, to do better. And of course, um, uh, right here is uh, the end of the session. That's all we have for today. Thank you for your participation. Uh, here we wish you all the best in your future endeavors and hope you have a wonderful evening as well as an amazing weekend. Thank you.